Well, up until yesterday, you wouldn't have known uh, uh, that it was Christmas time. But if you go into any home, uh, any store, any mall, any church, uh, really anywhere, it, it becomes obvious. You can't turn on the TV, you can't uh, open up an email, you can't uh, uh, browse the internet without the irrefutable evidence that it's Christmas time. The trees are up and trimmed. Cool 108 has transformed themselves into an auditory paradise once again. And the Hallmark Channel is living up to its promise of providing endless amounts of cheesy and predictable Christmas stories. Uh, the cookies are baked. Uh, it might not all be happiness and cheer, but we do sing along with the Peanuts cast that Christmas time is indeed here. Uh, it's an interesting time of year. For some of us, it really is the most wonderful time of the year. We have fond memories of Christmas past, and so we work hard to make the, special se- uh, the season special because it's so, it's so special uh, to us. For some of us also, though, it's the most dreadful time of the year. Because this is the time of year that we've lost loved ones, or we have significant hurts or painful memories that come up around this time of of year. For those, it's doubly hard because there's this cultural pressure to be uh, happy and and joyful uh, in this season that uh, really only tends to put fresh scabs on old scars. To those people, Christmas is an unavoidable season that they would just uh, um, rather get through and move on. When we come to the Bible, however, we find that Christmas really is the perfect time for both. It's the perfect time for those who relish the season and those who would avoid it if possible. For those who relish the season, who love the season, it, it, uh, the Bible helps us bring uh, them down to reality. It strips them of the traditions and the expectations and the grandiosity that often comes with this season. It brings them back to the core of what Christmas is all about. For those who aren't fans, it provides hope in the midst of of very troubling times and deep hurts and memories. It gives hope. It gives a vision that God recognizes and, and enters into our hardships. And it's at Christmas time that Both need to come together to draw close to God. So we're going to look at a familiar passage uh, this morning. We're going to look at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. We read it here just a few minutes ago, but we're going to look at it with fresh eyes. Uh, We're going to see that the angel's visit to Mary and her response uh, is a paradigm for faith and for hope. It's not just about a baby that... uh, was predicted to come, but rather it is about the fact that you and I are far more sinful than we ever thought possible, but we are more loved than we ever could imagine. So I'm going to read it again, and then we're going to break it down into to four shorter sections here. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee in Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the, the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, Well, how is this going to be? Since I'm a virgin. And he answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is about the six months with
okay, I put it, I know I put it in that list, or it's in one of those lists over there. It should be Christmas Sermon 1 or Christmas Message 1 or something. I don't know. Okay, well, then you'll have to actually really listen carefully. Oh, there we go. Great. Um, four things we need to see about real faith here uh, in the midst of this story. The first is, is that we need to reflect on God's uh, grace in light of your sinfulness. Reflect on God's grace in light of, of your sinfulness. You know, uh, we've, uh, we've said it many times before that grace can be defined as unmerited favor. This is unearned. It's not something that you can uh, obtain. It has to be something that's given to you. And in the, the Christian world, in, in the Christian lingo, this is one of our favorite words to use. It's a buzzword that we, that we throw around, uh, that God, the, the creator and the sustainer of everyone and everything, has given us grace. He has given us undeserved favor. He has loved us even though we are very unlovely ourselves. This grace is extended in two ways. On, on, on the one hand, uh, he gives mankind grace regardless of their commitments to him, regardless of their sentiments toward him. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, Jesus says that, that God the Father makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. I mean, both rain and sun are, are good and important things, especially in an agrarian society. The Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 17, verse 25, that he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. It is by God's grace and his grace alone that any one of us are here today breathing oxygen. Doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. No one deserves this kind of kindness. If God gave us to what we, uh, what we deserved, all of us would be snuffed out right now. But yet, he gives us these things graciously. On the other hand, he gives special grace to those who come to him in faith. He has provided eternal life. He has provided freedom from, from the power of sin, redemption from that old self, and salvation of our soul. It, this is totally an undeserved grace. There's nothing that we could do to earn it. There's no amount of money that we could pay in order to get it. The wealthiest person in the world could not pay God a sum and be guaranteed uh, to have God's pleasure rest on him. It is simply and freely given out of God's good will for those who come to Jesus in faith. Now, as good as that grace is, it can be a very offensive thing. If you think that you deserve grace, if you see something special about yourself, your, your good looks, your bank account, your achievements, your your education, your volunteer hours, your, your pedigree, your, your church attendance, if you think that you deserve God's grace, then you don't understand grace at all. And you haven't received it. What you are wanting, rather, is a paycheck. You've put in your time, you've done your service, you've done what you think that you need to do, and so in your mind, God owes you. You might slap a grace badge over it, but it's not grace. And when you're in that kind of mindset, you're not going to get either. And it's going to result in a couple different things. Either you are going to be bitter towards God because he is not giving you exactly what you think that you deserve, or you're going to end up in a pit of despair because you cannot measure, uh, you cannot be that type of person that you think you need to be in order to gain God's favor. It's not going to end up well for either of us. On the other hand, God's grace is offensive to those who, who don't think they need it. Such a person cannot even fathom a reality in which they need God for anything. It implies weakness and failure. Well, sure, I make mistakes, but overall, I'm, I'm a really good person. So if anybody can be in with God, surely it's... It's got to be, it's got to be me. Such a person is offended at the notion of grace because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't match the image that we see in the mirror. 
Well, when we look at Luke chapter 1, we find that this angel, who is a messenger of God, comes to this, this little town. Um, it's more like a village. There's less than 500 people living there at the time. And his mission is to find this, this girl named Mary. Uh, she was engaged, or the, the biblical word is betrothed, which means that she was legally pledged to be married to a man whose name was Joseph. And an engagement at this time usually lasted about a year, and after that year, then they would, uh, they would come together and, and consummate the marriage. And, and all that to say that this angel whose name is Gabriel comes to Mary, and it is clear that she is a virgin. Now look with me in verse 28. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Now that phrase that the angel makes here has caused a lot of problems. Uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church has taken this to read, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And have used this as a catalyst to, to venerate her, even leading to uh, a semi-official doctrine that makes Mary co-redemptor with Jesus. Uh, it's, it, it's not exactly what it sounds, but in that doctrine, Mary is an assistant to Jesus in the, the process of redemption. But that's not what ha what's happening here at all. Uh, to put it that way is to say that the angel is acknowledging something inside of Mary by which God is attracted to. She's full of grace, and the Lord has taken note of her. But when we look at what's happening here, we, we find exactly the opposite. The angel goes to Mary, who by all accounts is an average Jewish teenage girl of the time. And the teenage girl, uh, I'm sorry, and the angel comes to her and says, uh, instead of saying, Hail Mary, full of grace, he, he recognizes her in the exact same way that he recognizes you and me and everybody else. Totally average. Nothing special about us. There's nothing here that would draw God's attention. She's not prettier. She's not smarter. She's certainly not richer, as this is a very, very poor town that she is uh, living in. The only thing that brings this angel to her with this news is simply that God has chosen to use her, just as he has done all of his servants up to that point and beyond. That is grace. She isn't favored for anything in and of herself. She is favored simply because God chose to use her. And that's the way that it works throughout the scriptures. There is no one in the scriptures or in, the, in history that has caught God's eye and compelled him to say, wow, that person's amazing. I can do some really cool things through that person. In fact, Romans 11 tells us that it's from him and to him and through him are all things. And so Mary's reaction here is the same as anyone who has been confronted with the grace of God. Look in verse 29. It says that she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. In order to genuinely come to God, you have to mentally wrestle the way that Mary did. You have to see yourself as totally undeserving and totally unable. You have to loosen your grip that there is anything inside of you that would draw God toward you. And you have to see yourself rightly. The text is alluding to the fact that, that Mary is stewing all of this in her mind what do you mean, oh favored one? What do I have to bring to the table? And when we look at ourselves honestly, God's grace should always baffle us, excite us, and trouble us. But it should also relieve us from fear. Though we're worse than we ever thought possible, God is greater than we can ever imagine. And that's what we find in verse 30. The angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. God is the one that is, that is providing favor on undeserving people. 
And it can be really scary when we see ourselves rightly, when we see ourselves um, in the position spiritually that we're in. But when we find God's grace, it changes absolutely everything. So when we see ourselves for who we really are and we look to God for who he truly is, it should drive us to the object of our faith. And that's the second point that we have today is that we should receive the object of God's grace, which is Jesus. Receive the object of God's grace. So if we've become convinced of how deeply sinful we are, how undeserving God's grace to us is, uh, we need to see how it is that we become rightly with him. How is that grace applied? And, and we find that game plan in uh, Gabriel's next words here, starting in verse 31. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So we're going to get the problems that, uh, that this creates in Mary's mind here in just a minute. But for now, let's look at the plan of God. Almost every parent, if you have been a parent, you have dreams for your children. And those dreams... Uh, usually uh, consist of wanting your children to be better than you are, to uh, grow up more stably, grow up, uh, uh, you know, even financially, uh, successfully. We just, we, we want our kids to have a better life than we do. You'd have to be deluded as a parent, however, um, to think that your child would be the promised one. Um, the eternal king, the son of David. But yet that is exactly what Gabriel is telling Mary here. His name will be Jesus, which is a derivative of Yeshua or Joshua is the name that we know. It means that God is salvation. God is savior. Now, Jesus was a really popular name back in his time, kind of like Mike was back in the 1980s. There's a lot of Mikes that are around my age, not so much anymore. Same way with Jesus. There were a lot of Jesuses running around there. This is uh, not surprising. But then he says that he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Now hold on here. Son of the Most High? You do a a search in your Bibles and look up the term the Most High God or the Most High. It's all over the place talking about God the Father is the Most High above all things. And yet this angel is saying that this is going to be his son. But not just a son, this will be God in the flesh. Mary knew her Bible well. She knew what Isaiah 7.14 said, and it's the the namesake of our church. Therefore the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and and his name shall be Emmanuel. Emmanuel literally means God with us. The angel is telling her, that this baby, whose formal name will be Jesus, God is salvation, is God with us. So here's Mary. She's listening to this angel who is telling her about Isaiah 7.14, which was a prophecy that had been written 600 years before this particular event. And she is understanding that this young lady or virgin from Isaiah 7.14 is talking about her. Not only this child, will, not only will this child be that one, but he will be the king. And he's referring to 2 Samuel 7 when, when God told David that there's going to be a descendant on your throne that will live forever. It won't just be king after king that comes from your lineage. You're going to have one that will be king forever and ever. So you can understand that Mary here is a bit confused. 
And obviously, she's in a different situation as we are, but just as she had to receive this news in faith, so must we. We must look at this not as some mythical story, but as real, factual history. The Christian story is the only system in the world that puts together and makes sense of why our world is the way that it is. When sin entered the world through Adam, it was passed down to every single person that would come from him. You and I, we we feel the effects every day. You might have woken up this morning and reminded you right there that we live in a fallen world. And you you, uh, trace the Bible and all these problems and we see that every single problem that we have in our life is because of sin. But from the time that sin entered through Adam, God promised to send one who would reverse that curse. So as we go through our uh, Bible reading, whether it's uh, chronological or straight through, the question that should be coming to mind and should have been the question for any Jew growing up in that is, is this person the one? Is it Seth? Is it Samuel? Is it this? And we find that none of them are. Why? Because a sinful man cannot save sinful men ultimately. We need one who is both God and man in one person. We need someone who is son of the Most High and son of Mary, fully God, fully human in one person. So when the angel came to Mary and said what he said, he was previewing what Paul would write in Galatians chapter 4, where he said, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, uh, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So unless we see what Mary saw, unless we see the grace of God in the face of Jesus Christ, as our only hope for redemption, then we don't have it. You can't do this on your own. It's not possible. You're not that clever. You need someone better. So why not trust in this king who has come, not as a political ruler, so to speak, but rather as one who holds your every breath, who knows you deep down for who you really are, who has seen every single thing that you've ever done, said, or thought, and yet loves you deeply anyway. Why not receive the object of God's grace in Jesus Christ? Third, we need to relay our questions to God. Relay our questions to God. You know, one of the most important aspects of coming to faith and staying in the faith is to be open and honest with God about our doubts, about our struggles, about our worries, about our fears. God doesn't seem to be offended. When we come to him with questions that are that are asked in good faith. It's easy to have bad faith when you ask a question. You don't want to know the answer, so you try to throw out some zinger. But if you come with genuine faith, God receives those questions. And that's exactly what, uh, what we see here. That Mary was not judged for her lack of faith like Zechariah in in just the story before when he didn't believe Gabriel that John the Baptist would come from his barren wife. So let's look at Mary's honest question and relate it to those of our own. Look at verse 34. Mary said to her, uh, I'm sorry, Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin and uh, I took biology class, I know how these things work. I mean, this is a fair question, isn't it? Can we blame Mary for it? She certainly knew about the birds and the bees. A virgin conception sounded just as crazy to Mary as it does to us today. I've heard objections from folks who see Christianity as a myth Uh, say something to the extent of, well, yeah, you know, I mean, it would have been easy to believe in a virgin birth back then, but because we have technology and biology studies and all that, we know better than, than that today. 
Really? So people back then didn't know how this happened. If six, seven months from now, Mary went walking around Nazareth, big as a house, and people were talking about her. You know how small town people are. People are talking about her and asking her, eh, you've been around town a little bit too much? And if she said, uh, no, 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 it's not what you think. This is a virgin conception. I'm bearing the child of God. Do you think anybody in that town would say, oh, that makes sense? <laughs> and go, on. nobody would have thought that. It's just as radical as it is today. From a biological standpoint, this is impossible. It can only be supernatural. And so it makes sense that Mary says to the angel, so how is this going to go down? And if you're going to have real faith, it requires real questions. Why did God allow this? How did God do that? Why did this happen? Why this? Why that? Those questions are okay. What really matters, though is whether or not we are going to trust him even if the answers are not what we like, expect, or want. Are we going to trust him? Notice in verse 35 that the angel didn't give her a clear-cut answer. He said, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Boy, that sure brings a whole lot of clarity to how it's going to happen, doesn't it? But yet this, this, uh, this term that the, uh, uh, about the Holy Spirit coming upon her is very closely related. In fact, it's the same word that's used in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples and the apostles and the church is, is, is born. So there is some, some birth uh, overtones that is going on there as well. When the Holy Spirit acts upon people, crazy things happen. We don't need a biological explanation for how this could be possible. We just need to know that it did. Now, it might not be the answer that Mary was looking for. She probably could have been happy enough with the angel saying, look, uh, look, we know that you're engaged. You got a year to be married. After you're married, guess what? Your husband, he's in the line of King David. Your son is the coming king. And that would have been perhaps a little more believable. And to assure her, though, the angel gives her news about a relative of hers, Elizabeth. Um, everyone says that she's a cousin. We really don't know if she's a cousin. She's quite older than Mary. Mary's probably 13. Elizabeth is post-menopause at this point. And so her and her husband, Zechariah, are in their twilight years. They were, uh, they were godly people who suffered from infertility. They weren't able to have children. So imagine the angel saying to Mary, yeah, this is how it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit's going to come, come upon you. Don't believe me? Hey, you know your cousin or your relative, whoever it is, Elizabeth? Remember how she's, you know, there's no way that she can have a baby and she's been barren. They've always wanted a child. Hey, guess what? She's six months along. You might want to go and see her and see the proof of that. So he's assuring her of what is happening here. Um, and if Elizabeth could be pregnant, then who 